to all. It's, it is an honor for me to welcome you all to the Asian Development Bank and the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning webinar on lifelong learning, learning cities and smart cities on my capacity as UIL governing board member. Firstly, I would like to emphasize that this webinar is very timely, very relevant, and really contributing to the SDG goals. Today, we will discuss the key role of lifelong learning through building a learning society to a nation's economic development. Education should extend beyond the formal learning based in traditional educational concepts. To facilitate this, it is crucial to build a learning city that offers a range of lifelong learning opportunities for all, young or old, in formal or non-formal setting, particularly reaching the most disadvantaged, vulnerable through different actors, whether by local governments, institutions, or communities. With digital technologies and internet becoming increasingly integrated into learning, the demand for smart learning has grown steadily. Smart education is a big component in smart city development. Our experts will be sharing that later. Incorporating elements of e-learning infrastructure, digital tools and innovations through education technologies. Learning Cities is a place-based initiative, of course, led by UIL and partners for implementing smart education and lifelong learning. As a director of Simeo Secretariat, I wish to share that in our region, we have already started highly investing in the education sector to modernize and keep up with the current market demand. There were samples or countries that really force small, smart notebooks, projectors, smart devices. They're trying to coordinate all of these educational materials, providers, software innovators, hardware providers to work together so as we can have a smart education and learning sector in Southeast Asia. I would like to also share, even though this is just a welcome remarks, that smart cities are also flourishing across Southeast Asia. By 2025, the number of inhabitants in medium-sized cities of Southeast Asia is expected to double. Thus, governments in the region are resorting to technological and digital solutions. Just like in the 32nd ASEAN Summit in 2018, the ASEAN Smart Cities Network was established as a collaborative platform where 26 cities from the 10 ASEAN member states can work towards common goal of developing smart and sustainable urban development. And education plays a key role in one of these six development areas. So interesting that we will be discussing that today. I am delighted that, that the Asian Development Bank and the UIL have organized this webinar today in a timely manner to explore the importance of lifelong learning, the gains that we have undertaken growing trend of learning cities and smart cities. I wish you all a successful and fruitful webinar. Thank you very much. So now I, it's time for Mr. Ra to, to address his uh, speech. Thank you very much, uh, Christina, and also Atel for welcome and also very insightful remarks. At first, I'd like to give my big thanks to the UNESCO Lifelong Learning Institute and the Global Network of Learning Cities for this webinar on a topic that what highly relevant to the future development agenda of ADB member countries. In particular, many thanks to the director of the UNESCO Lifelong Learning Institute, David Achuarena, also Krishna Drew from the Global Net Network of the Learning Cities, and other specialists who made this event happen. 
I am very glad to see ADB's friends, Atel Venezuela, who play key roles in education in our region also join and deliver the welcome remarks. We are very happy to present our books on powering a learning society during an age of disruption. It is a privilege to collaborate with eminent groups of the 40 author and co-authors who contributed 21 articles. We are very happy that an article from UIL director David on the work on learning cities. This book is open access, can be downloaded by anyone. 49,000 downloads in about nine months, six months, shows that the topics are important in the global context of reimagining education. The book title says, Powering a Learning Society. Why powering? Why a learning society? What is the learning society? And what is the age of disruption? I have been a director for Human Social Development, ADB, for some time, have helped the team to design and implement some of the biggest education programs and projects supported by ADB, particularly in South Asia. The more I expanded my work in this area, the more of a champion I become on why education will be the most important powering agent for economic and social development. The age of disruption may be deemed as COVID-19, which of course has been one of the greatest disruptor of all times, challenging all of us. But this book also deals with trend related to the fourth industrial revolution and digitalization which were redrawing conventional approaches. Digital transformation is powering major changes to the way economies and society live, work, produce, consume, and trade. With more people living in urban area, we need to ensure that there are adequate inclusive services for all in urban area, what we call livable city in ADB. My colleague, Santi will share some insight on the implication of forced industrial revolution and digital skills for future of work. I thought of the topic of a learning society primarily to reevaluate the role of the different actors. While the concept of a learning society is not new, current times call for us to reimagine it. COVID-19 is a wake-up call for us to realize how important it is for different actors to work together to cope with unprecedented disruption. It is critical to promote relevant learning of a high quality through all modalities, formal, non-formal, informal. And people everywhere like rural, urban, remote community, and for disadvantaged and also poor groups, especially girls and women. Education is not a sole responsibility of schools and university. This book highlights that more than ever before, education is everyone's responsibility. In our book, we show other actors such as civic and municipal authority, urban planner, transport professional need to support education, not just for children and youth, but also mid-career and old people. Research by Brookings Institute shows that the importance of space for playful learning. UNESCO has established a great network with learning city. The skill intelligence model designed by National Skill Academy for Rail in UK has shown the workforce planning is important for continuous training for safe operation of infrastructure asset. As we discussed in the book, there's a need to bridge physical and virtual system and help to solve societal problem like climate change, environmental sustainability, and food security. Cultural systems such as museum, library, art gallery, sports facility have a growing role in play supporting education. Our counterparts are hungry for transformative initiative in education. As chair of education committee at ADB, I believe Innovative knowledge solutions are at the heart of being responsive to the development need in the region. Development organizations such as ADB and also UNESCO have to bring value addition through global 
knowledge sharing. Lifelong, lifelong learning is about learning throughout one's life. And life-wide learning provides opportunity to the people to learn in all space of life, in school, at home, in community, in volunteer and service activities, in sports clubs, or creative pursuit. Given the multi-dimensionality of development challenges, education system need to provide diverse option and be inclusive. ADB and UNESCO can collaborate to share knowledge and experience with other partner countries. In South Asia, I am enabling ADB investment in new age universities such as IT University in Bangladesh and a skill universe in India, which can help to create the skill, talent, need for lifelong learning, learning city, and also sustainable city, and for higher order digital occupation. A number of societal challenges have to be dealt with. UN has projected that a number of old people in Asia Pacific will triple reaching 1.3 billion by 2050, making a region with the highest portion of old people. At the same time, Currently, we have the largest generation of the young people globally in the history of the history of the about 1.5 billion, half of which are in the South, in the Asia and Pacific region. What this means is that CT education system need to cater to both young people entering labor market with the right type of skill, but also reskilling, upskilling of old for old people. To stay longer in the workforce, in smart, in smart cities, we need pretty much all the citizens to be able to access digital services. UNESCO could partner with ADB to share lessons from global policy and also practices on innovative education. Typically, we have tended to bring advanced knowledge and experience from leaders in the region like Singapore, Japan, Australia, and Korea. We welcome the opportunity for knowledge alliance between Asia and the other part of the world, such as Europe, Africa, Latin America. Reciprocally, we are happy to share innovative project and program in Asia and Pacific too. You know, increasingly globalized world, such a partnership would be beneficial and also increase development impact. It would be great if ADB and UNESCO could do more to leverage our respective comparative advantage to strengthen linkage between education and training and also CT development to bring synergy value addition. Learning City program of UNESCO and ADB livable city initiatives could potentially have synergies for joint action that can tap. Many thanks again hosting this discussion today I look forward to hearing about the experience of the award-winning Learning City of Wyndham from the Diane, also Mike Gobsman. I hope we can take this dialogue to the next level as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ra. Thank you. Very interesting to have the figures uh, with you. Uh, outlining the, the future perspectives. Thank you so much presenting the, the book as well. Um, I think we can go on uh, to UIR director, Mr. David Achuarena, who also contributed to the book you were just presenting. Uh, he is here with us. And Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christina. Uh, good uh, afternoon. Uh, uh, good morning to, to, to all, uh, Dr. Uh, Valenzuela, uh, Dr. Suksukura, uh, colleagues from the uh, Asian uh, Development Bank. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure for me to be here for this uh, seminar. First of all, I would like to congratulate uh, the Asian Development Bank for having uh, taken the initiative of uh, producing this book, uh, which is, uh, I think, very uh, timely. And uh, I think that we, we saw already, as uh, uh, Dr. Sukhsubra mentioned, that it attracted a lot uh, of attention globally. 
uh, and it uh, gave us also an opportunity for this uh, partnership uh, between uh, UL uh, and ADB to look at a particular uh, dimension of this uh, topic, uh, which is how to actually make lifelong learning a reality and, and more precisely how learning cities uh, which are now emerging as a, I would say a global movement throughout the world can constitute a, a very important instrument uh, of uh, this development. Uh, first of all, I, I'd like to maybe reflect uh, on uh, where we stand globally in relation to lifelong learning. Uh, making lifelong learning a reality is still you know, on, on the agenda. Is it a dream? Is it a challenge? or is it a realistic goal? Uh, I think it's important to recall that this is not a new concept. Um, we just released, UNESCO just released uh, two weeks ago at the General Conference uh, of UNESCO, which just took place uh, in Paris, a new report of the International a commission on the futures uh, of education. And the report is entitled Reimagining Our Futures Together, a new social contract for uh, education. So this actually took place uh, almost 50 years uh, after the uh, publication of the so-called uh, four a report, which uh, introduced you know, this concept of a learning uh, society. And it also follows upon the so-called Delors report that was uh, published in 96, uh, which outlined the four pillars of education, learning to be, learning to do, learning to know, and uh, uh, learning to live together. So I think that it's important to see this kind of, uh, you know, uh, long-term perspective, uh, you know, since uh, this concept of uh, a learning society was uh, introduced and uh, also together with this notion of uh, lifelong learning, uh, education permanent in, in the um, words of uh, um, the four report. Uh, one of the important uh, recommendations of this new uh, uh, report of the International Commission is actually the establishment uh, of a universal right to lifelong learning. So lifelong learning is really continues to be really uh, at the uh, top of international agenda. And I think it's important to relate that also to the adoption in 2015 of uh, the SDGs uh, and in particular SDG 4, uh, the goal on education, which actually positioned uh, lifelong learning as uh, the, the conceptual really framework for driving uh, uh, education uh, policies uh, around the world. So to a large extent, lifelong learning uh, constitutes now a sort of benchmark for reforming education systems uh, and for uh, designing new education uh, policies. What is new uh, with uh, the SDGs is that sustainable development requires a transdisciplinary approach, an intersectoral approach. It's, I think, a clear recognition that uh, working separately uh, on employment policies, economic development policies, health policies, education policies doesn't work. What is needed is, is really to make the links between uh, those different dimensions of sustainable development. And this is also the vision for lifelong learning. I mean, lifelong learning uh, in the sustainable development agenda is not conceived only in relation to education. It's not only about SDG 4, it's also how to promote learning, knowledge, information in order to achieve the other SDGs. So this uh, uh, dimension, I think, is really uh, very uh, important. And, and this uh, provides really the ground to uh, revitalize and, and reform uh, public uh, policies for, for, for development. For learners also, uh, lifelong learning uh, involves uh, linking learning with different uh, domains of, of life, work, personal development, uh, uh, health, family, citizenship, it's the so-called life-wide 
uh, dimension of, of lifelong learning that uh, Mr. Suksubra uh, was uh, mentioning in his, uh, in his speech. So more and more lifelong learning is, is conceived as, as a continuum integrating uh, throughout life different types of educational activities, formal and uh, non-formal, and corresponding to a wide range of goals for individuals, for societies, and increasingly for the planet. And I think this is uh, you know, materialized uh, through the target uh, 4.7 of uh, SDG4, which uh, uh, talks about sustainable development, which talks about global uh, citizenship. So as such, the, the concept of lifelong learning uh, is uh, increasingly uh, learner-centered. And what is new in this concept is that it's not only about pedagogy, it's really about the philosophy of lifelong learning to empower people as an instrument of, of empowerment. And this is reflected or translated into policy uh, instruments. And I would like to, to stress three dimensions. First of all, in terms of uh, offering a wide range of, of learning opportunities, and technology is now changing the, the game, the rules of the game in terms of providing access. Secondly, in terms of providing a new range of incentives uh, to individuals through uh, new social rights. And, and thirdly, uh, with uh, uh, adopting a focus on the most disadvantaged groups. And I think that this is really the focus also of uh, the uh, SDGs, leaving no one behind. So how learning cities are actually playing a role in that broad uh, context? Learning cities can be defined uh, as an urban entity uh, committed to uh, promote lifelong learning for all uh, at local level. And beyond uh, developing education as a right, the goal is also to use uh, lifelong learning as an instrument for sustainable development. So this is this transversal and intersectoral dimension of sustainable development that I was referring to. So it's about SDG 4, but it's also about the other uh, SDGs. So this concept uh, emerged first uh, in the late 80s as, as a way to link uh, education with uh, economic development and the labor market uh, at the local level. But increasingly, uh, it developed not only in Europe, but throughout uh, the world, but as a, a way of translating really this comprehensive vision of uh, sustainable development uh, involving cities not only uh, in Europe, but in, in all parts of the world. And I think uh, in Asia in particular, the movement uh, has been quite strong uh, with, with countries uh, uh, like uh, China, uh, like Korea, where uh, this movement is actually part of a national strategy for lifelong learning, uh, which with also the establishment of, of national networks of learning cities. So uh, at the international, we see now that there are a number of groupings, you know, for uh, learning cities, including uh, the UNESCO Global Network uh, of uh, Learning Cities, which uh, brings together more than uh, 220 cities now from different uh, parts of the world. And I'm happy that uh, we have some of them uh, part uh, of this discussion uh, uh, today. Uh, we just had uh, uh, two weeks ago, we, we just uh, uh, completed uh, the fifth uh, uh, international conference of learning cities, uh, in, in fact, in, in Asia, in, in, in Yonsu, in the Republic of Korea. That was a, a very, I would say, important uh, conference because of a topic. It actually looked at the contribution of lifelong learning to well being and health drawing lessons from the experience of learning cities in responding to the COVID-19 crisis. And I think that we, we saw that uh, learning cities uh, and lifelong learning uh, can be a very strong uh, instrument to actually build uh, uh, resilience uh, and, uh, and recovery. So um, there are a, a number of, uh, of lessons uh, that we can learn from uh, uh, learning cities throughout the world so far. And I think that it's, it's important maybe to note that uh, the, in their diversity, uh, they actually you know, share common uh, principles. 
Uh, first of all, recognizing uh, uh, the right to education as, as a basic, you know, uh, an important uh, principle and progressively moving to an aspiration to a right to, to lifelong learning. Um, prioritizing learner engagement, uh, building citizenship uh, at local level, uh, and also promoting beyond promoting uh, local democracy. And I think it's important uh, to, to stress that point uh, in the present context where we see a growing mistrust between citizens and institutions. Uh, worldwide and the COVID-19 situation, I mean, as, as illustrated that in, in many ways, in many parts of the world, we've also seen an increase in urban violence, in domestic violence. And I think that uh, the learning cities in uh, promoting the participation of, of, of citizens in decision-making, in uh, analyzing problems, finding solutions and implementing uh, uh, policies is to a certain extent a way uh, to promote really local and citizenship uh, engagement. And maybe in that way, the Learning Cities movement is contributing to the revival of uh, democracy at the, at the local level. And as, as uh, in doing that, it also really contributes to building a learning uh, society. Now, if we look at the experience with uh, COVID-19, uh, I think there are four really uh, key dimensions uh, uh, where learning cities uh, provided a clear illustration of the, the power of, of lifelong learning. First of all, in relation to the use uh, of, of ICT and digital uh, resources. We've seen uh, many illustrations of how municipalities have actually contributed to uh, promote uh, connectivity, to promote access to devices with a focus on the most vulnerable groups. And I think this is also an interesting illustration of how we can bring together learning cities and smart cities. Uh, inclusion as, as the top priority. Again, um, in the context uh, of COVID-19, which contributed to rising inequalities, learning cities have uh, placed uh, you know, inclusion and equity at the core of their interventions through lifelong learning, but integrated within social protection uh, programs, uh, as well as uh, with health uh, education uh, programs. Third, in terms of, of uh, you know, developing new urban policies and linking the different uh, sectors. So I think that COVID-19 forced, in a way, uh, uh, municipalities uh, to build bridges across, across sectors and, uh, it, and to meet different goals at the same time, food security, health, social protection, work. And, and finally, the fourth dimension is really about uh, local citizenship and, and how the COVID-19 crisis actually contributed to show and promote new forms of solidarities at local level and to also involve citizens in, in solving very concrete uh, problems. So to conclude, I would say that certainly the, the road is still long towards achieving uh, the goal of lifelong learning for all. We are still many countries uh, are struggling with uh, very basic uh, uh, education needs. We still have about 773 million uh, illiterate uh, people in the world, many of them in, in, uh, in, in Asia, in fact, the majority in, in, in Asia. But at the same time, we see that the progress is significant since the four report 50 years ago. We have a clear commitment of the international community with uh, um, the SDGs. We have also uh, a number of uh, developments uh, that uh, actually pave the way towards the recognition of uh, a right to, to lifelong learning. And we have at the national level, a number of uh, policy instruments and interventions that actually contribute to building lifelong learning uh, pathways. Recognition and validation uh, of, of, of learning and poor learning, uh, qualification uh, uh, frameworks, individual learning accounts, and new uh, initiatives uh, in, in enlarging and broadening the legal framework for education to actually open it to, to lifelong learning. So the, the, we are making progress, and certainly the smart uh, cities uh, is also a, a way to really uh, capitalize on the power of technology to build 
learning uh, society. So I think that uh, we are in a, in a very I would say, stimulating uh, uh, time and uh, in relation to, to, this, uh, to this goal. And within that framework, uh, I really would like to say that I welcome and I look forward to, to further exchange and, and partnership between uh, ADB uh, and UL uh, to contribute to actually assist uh, uh, member states uh, in, in, that, uh, in that vision of making lifelong learning uh, a reality and building learning societies. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. I think it was very interesting to get this historic overview. And uh, yes, also receiving this um, philosophical approach actually. Uh, and at the same time, you gave quite a quite clear factors of the benefits of lifelong learning. I think it would be nice now to hear from um, the principal education specialist from the Asian Development Bank. Her name is uh, Shanti Jagannathan. And yes, she has a presentation prepared. And I'm looking forward to her to hear from her. Uh, about, yes, the, the skills needed, the talents needed. I think that will be her focus. We can see your screen. So somehow I'm not able to... Uh, uh. You can share your screen, we just saw it was something else. It was not the presentation, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's try again, yes. Yes, I see the first slide. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Christina. Thank, a big hello to everyone joining the session today, uh, and special thanks to UIL, particularly to David and Christina, but also thanks a lot to Ethel, um, Diane, and Michael for joining the session today. Um, I want to thank Songsu who spoke a little earlier. You know, who was the one who conceived the idea of a, of, of a book on learning society, and. It, it was quite a learning journey for me uh, to, when we assembled the articles in, in the book. So my presentation today um, is related to one of the topics, which is about the implications of the uh, disruptive digital technologies that are making a sweep in the world. Um, so, uh, you know, when we think about uh, recent times, there are many trends that are, uh, that, that are at play, um, which are calling for, agile and lifelong learning systems, uh, and which are also calling for a reimagining and a rejuvenation of education and training. So what are these drivers? Uh, the first is, is, of course, the exponential rise of the disruptive technologies, also termed as the fourth industrial revolution technologies. The second is that skills uh, gained are increasingly becoming uh, very short-lived, they have a short shelf life and become obsolete very fast, which call for uh, continuous skills upgrades. Third is that future labor markets are very uncertain. So uh, graduates are navigating very uncertain terrain as they prepare for future job markets, uh, which are calling for more agile training systems. Fourth, millennials, who are also the digital natives, are um, learning as a continuing continuum way beyond the four walls of education institutions. And last, of course, and, and of course not least, um, climate change is calling for a very adaptive and supportive education system uh, to serve the society and the economy of the future. So given the influential role played by these technologies, ADP has, has, been, has undertaken studies to look at uh, the implications of the fourth industrial revolution on skills and jobs. Um, the study that was, com that was completed earlier this year was, was in four ASEAN countries, looking at eight sectors. Um, and I'll just share here a few insights. There are a suite of 
five reports that you can find on the ADP side. Um, the, the studies are based on extensive surveys of employers as well as training institutions to gain insights on what is the transition like is like from uh, uh, you know from the previous generation to the next generation of both industrial revolution technologies at the workplace. The first is that um, the, a, a good majority of employers expect productive incre productivity increases of over twenty five percent from the deployment of uh, 4IR technologies. While sectors such as automotive, BPO, and all obviously will, will, you know, will, will gain benefit from this. But we found that uh, even uh, uh, sectors like beverages, um, food, food and beverages and textiles are also likely to uh, enjoy significant productivity gains. The second is that um, the longer term, in the longer term, 4IR will, will lead to net job gains. You'll all remember that you know, automation and uh, uh, 4IR had led to alarms about uh, the loss of jobs, but our study found that they, they are likely to be net job gains, even in traditionally labor uh, intensive sectors that may undergo automation. And this is going to come from uh, productivity increases, but also increased demand over time but it's also predicated on timely investments in the skills needed to make the transition. And of course, there will be job losses. So the fact that they can be offset by, uh, by, uh, uh, by, by, by new net job creation depends on preparing the talent pool necessary to do that. Um, the third takeaway is that employers believe that routine and analytical tasks will be, will be replaced by uh, you know, uh, uh, by non-routine and analytical, a routine task will be replaced by non-routine and analytical tasks. This is, of course, is finding from many studies and our study also corroborated that. Um, the next takeaway is that additional training or reskilling and, and for, for the fourth industrial revolution will have to come from on the job training in addition to training institutions, which again speaks to this whole notion of lifelong learning uh, uh, in our societies. The last takeaway that I'd like to mention for today is that uh, we the study found a big mismatch between training institutions and employers. While in uh, training institutions tended to be uh, far more um, optimistic about the readiness of their graduates, employers found that they, they needed to be much more effort to help them be prepared for the workforce of tomorrow. So now, I mean, in this slide is really a sort of a few anecdotes that I just put together. Uh, you know, we always talk about the fourth industrial revolution as if it's in the future, and we have to prepare for the future. But that future is actually already here when we look at the numbers um, uh, that, that, uh, that are at play, and including in Asia and the Pacific, whether it's to do with Robotics, with it, uh, you know, industrial robots in installation in many countries, including in Asia, or what's the do? It's does to do with the expansion of the blockchain market, where Asia is again expected to gain a substantial share, or it's to do with uh, e-commerce or uh, increases in private equity investments in edtech. Or of course, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is on a high, uh, uh, upwardly uh, increasing uh, uh, trajectory in terms of uh, investments, including in developing countries in Asia. So it's no longer a question of preparing for the future; it's preparing for the present almost. Uh, so, so these are these are the sort of uh, you know trends that we need to think about when we uh, when we have to prepare for the workforce of the future. Uh, so now, what does all this mean for, uh, you know, for, uh, so I just want to bring it back to the discussion on uh, learning cities and smart cities. I've sort of tried to uh, bring the two together. Now, these, these components that you see on the screen, you know, whether it's smart campus or, uh, you know, education platforms, online learning or so on, these are, could be elements of a digital learning city. So these are the means by which uh, a digital learning city can provide the type of education opportunities to, to all its citizens, whether it is young people um, at, the, at the start of their career or mid-career or more advanced. So the, these are the sort of means by which uh, um, a learning city can deliver smart solutions in education. But 
But on the other hand, when we think about learning cities in the context of digitalization, we also need to look at the flip side, which is what kind of skills and talent are needed to power such uh, learning cities? How do they come about? How can they be designed, installed, and implemented? Uh, so on the one hand, uh, we need to think about skills uh, digital uh, digital skills that can serve jobs uh, in in smart cities that are to do that that are to serve sectors like intelligent transportation systems, AI based infrastructure maintenance, smart cities, which which all of which need people with higher order talent like data science uh, engineers, but also technicians who can help to install and maintain facilities. Platform companies are also servicing. Uh, customers now in completely different ways compared to conventional business models. Uh, there is now much more hyper customization and hyper localization. And there's a new age of retail and, and logistics that um, that use algorithms, uh, artificial intelligence to, to assess and predict consumer behavior, all of which is very new. And this has been given a great new boost thanks to COVID. And as you know, e-commerce is particularly is on a very high growth rate uh, as a result of uh, the, the, the pulls and pressures of, of COVID-19. So the workforce at the front end of the service delivery would need to become far more tech savvy uh, to, to, to work in these sectors. Next up is, you know, we think about digital and sustainability coming together, smart and sustainability coming together, uh, uh, which then which which then mean you know things like smart grids for energy efficient uh, uh, installations, climate resilient infrastructure. As per ADB study estimates, uh, uh, there is a there is a sort of the, the the market for climate resilient infrastructure is of the order of twenty six trillion dollars by twenty thirty. So, so all of this is going to need people to manage and implement. So how do we provide the skills needed to service uh, those types of um, economic installations going forward in the future is something we have to ask now. Um, and uh, similarly, um, use of digital tools for waste, uh, waste and water management, energy management, and smart logistics. These are all occupations that, will, that are becoming increasingly digital uh, uh, digital and e even AI based. So we need to think about the entire spectrum of investing in the right skills uh, to help expand the sustainability agenda in economic operations. Uh, next up, um, you know, uh, the digital is also influencing the labor market. Um, the rise of the gig economy is is uh, is obvious to all. In fact, uh, in, in 2021. Estimates put it put the gig, gig economy at nearly three hundred fifty billion dollars, and is only set to grow grow at a rapid pace. We now see the emergence of a global twenty four four by seven workforce. Uh, and apparently, the uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is a crowdsourcing and micro jobs platform, where you know big jobs are undertaken, have has already more than seven million use, users. Uh, um, in the last check, so all this means that. We are not talking about skills for multitasking and skills for multiple occupations. So in the gig economy, an individual is, is working across different jobs and different kinds of occupations. So those are the implications that we need to think about when, when we have to prepare the skills of the future. Digitalization and governance uh, means that uh, literally all citizens uh, need to have some degree of digital savviness. Uh, uh, you know, in, in, uh, like app-based financial transactions, mobile mobile finance has taken root even in the most uh, uh, difficult circumstances in developing countries, even where uh, uh, resources tend to be low in uh, and and uh, and even among partially illiterate populations. So what this means is that uh, the digital is is going to have a great relevance even for people with with lower levels of education. Uh, and literacy. So um, there's also great growth in um, in the digital for digital and AI in the context of creative uh, the creative industry with its creative goods and services, uh, including things like the the the, the whole um, yeah, creative uh, digital industry of whether it's films, 
uh, web screening, uh, 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 photography, fashion, everything is becoming increasingly digital, which means that we really need to think about uh, 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 the digital for, for every possible occupation. But what does all this mean for education and training? Uh, uh, so firstly, I think we need to think about a whole ecosystem that spans, uh, that covers brick and mortar institutions, but also blended programs, boot camps, virtual academies, and a bundle of different sets, so which, is, which is something what a learning society should be offering. Uh, and lifelong learning will become more the dome and, uh, and, 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 and will take new meanings as we expand on this topic um, and cover different segments of the, of the population, like Sung Suk mentioned, and also David mentioned, the whole life-wide education and training so education and training, where they are, how they are uh, for all citizens and of all age groups. So, uh, and, and the fourth industrial revolution technologies will also be increasingly used in delivery of educational skills. Algorithms will be uh, used to help trainers to monitor levels of student engagement and, and grasp of their higher order, uh, higher order capacities. We can see much more of immersive learning using technologies. Uh, and we'll also all this will also call for uh, uh, for greater grasp of higher order competencies and acquisition uh, of of um, digital skills to navigate the navigate the future. So this also means that revenue streams associated with education and training will also change and will also evolve. Uh, uh, just as multiple channels of physical, virtual, and blended have uh, have uh, will take root, so. So there will be also room for different types of qualifications, whether it's degrees, new age, digital badges, or micro credentials, and so on will, will, become, in, uh, will become part of the ecosystem uh, for education and training. Um, students led training and uh, uh, will happen so that they can become the protagonists in choosing and, uh, and curating what, whatever the training choices are. And similarly, technologies will also power career coaching, counseling, and placement services will become far more important given the plethora of options out there. Um, so these services, uh, digitally powered or otherwise, will become equally important aspects of learning in smart cities. And we need to consider investing in adequate resources and adequate human capital to manage these services. So I just wanted to bring to light some aspects of what it what it will take to actually um, you know design implement and monitor and maintain uh, such smart learning cities. Thank you very much for listening, and we look forward to uh, the discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shanti. This was very interesting to, to hear with the very clear examples. And you were not only referring to the future, but to now. I think that was really uh, good that you underlined uh, the fourth industrial revolution is, is here and uh, learning cities uh, have, to, have to face it and they do. Thank you. Yes, talking about learning cities, we have the honor today that uh, we have actually a representative um, and it's Diane Tabak from Windham in Australia. And uh, Windham just recently got awarded um, the Learning City Award. It's a biennial award. Uh, so this uh, took place two months ago, one month ago, at the Fifth International Conference on Learning Cities. And um, yes, it's, it's a prize to our member cities um, that have really, yes, um, outstanding examples and best practices. Um, so that they really made significant progress in improving education and lifelong learning opportunities for all. So it would be very nice to hear from you some practical examples on training and how the city actually managed and what the city had, has been done so far. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. And, uh... I'm a little bit rusty with Zoom, so I'll just confirm that you can see um, you can see my slide. Yes, we can see the slide and also your notes. So um, hmm. maybe if you start the slideshow, 
um, well, you started it. There are still the notes. Maybe I can also try and do it from here if you wish. Uh, it may be faster. I'm. I've got the same problem where I can't stop sharing. Yes, let, again. let me try. I, I I cannot promise, but I hope it will work. Um, Do you see my screen now? With the... Do you see I it? can't see your screen. Are you able to just uh, take the sharing away from me? Oh, I see. It's a different screen. I think now I'm, I'm sharing the screen and uh, I'm not sure why you don't see it. Still, no? You don't see it? Um, try again, Christina, because Diane now just uh, stopped sharing hers. Yes, now it works. You can see the. Oh, uh, now it's the it's the um, notes. But now it should work. That's I see just the slide. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Um, so good evening, everyone. It's, it's evening here in Melbourne and in, uh, in, in Victoria, in Australia. Um, so I'm Diane Tabar, I'm the coordinator of learning community at Wyndham City Council. Um, I'd firstly like to acknowledge the peoples of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of the land on which Wyndham is being built. And thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today and to share Wyndham's experience of using technology to improve lifelong learning in our city, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I've certainly enjoyed hearing from all the other presenters so far. Uh, I'd like to thank the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning and the Asian Development Bank for hosting this excellent event and thank my fellow, fellow panelists. Now, so next slide, thanks. So just um, briefly, I will tell you where Wyndham is. Um, I can't see the next slide. Um, so Wyndham is located in southeastern Australia in the state of Victoria. There we go. Uh, our boundaries cover areas of urban, rural and coastal development. The population is currently 302,650 and we're one of the largest and fastest growing municipalities in our state and country. We have around 100 babies born every week. Almost half of all Wyndham residents were born overseas and are from 162 different countries. Wyndham Council is a major employer in the area and agriculture, construction, education and healthcare industries make up other areas of employment. Unfortunately, Wyndham recorded more cases of COVID-19 than any other council area in Australia. Despite this, we acknowledge that in a global context, Wyndham has fared relatively well, given the current numbers of cases around the world. Wyndham experienced massive job losses during the pandemic. Other impacts included negative impacts on mental health and well-being, physical health impacts of as, as a result of lockdowns, isolation, increased rates of anxiety and depression and psychological distress. I'd now like to share with you some of our responses to these challenges uh, and disruptions. Next slide, thanks. Uh, first, some background. Wyndham's work as a member of the UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities is driven by our learning community strategy with over 50 community partners delivering on 18 actions. We have a, uh, the strategy has, has a focus on celebrating living and learning in Wyndham, advocating for equality and quality and service provision, facilitating partnerships and collaboration across sectors, and innovating learning and fostering new entrepreneurial spirit. Next slide, thanks. So an inclusive and equitable lens on technology 
um, on technology enhanced learning has been a part of Wyndham's approach to lifelong learning, even before COVID-19. And some practices and projects I'd like to share with you include Wyndham Libraries, Wyndham Tech School, Learning for Earning Festival, the Wyndham Learning Festival and the Global Learning Festival. The next slide, thanks. So COVID-19 has had a major impact on the way we learn in Wyndham. Melbourne has spent more time in lockdown than any other city in the world. As a result, our schools and libraries were closed for long periods of time in 2020 and 2021. And we've had to quickly adapt to online learning opportunities. Digital inclusion is critical to maximising and sharing the benefits of the digital revolution. Wyndham has five library branches and each offers free public Wi-Fi and a range of digital programs, training, resources, and online e-safety courses to ensure everyone in the community can participate and benefit. Our existing home library service expanded during lockdowns and provided library books to local residents in a COVID safe manner. We received more than 800 orders every week for this service. Our e-library service also provided free access to our full catalogue of books, audio books, e-magazines and learning resources. And the community took this up in greater numbers during lockdowns. You can see the numbers on the screen there. Over 94,000 e-books have been borrowed, 80, over 84,000 audio books, over 228,000 e-magazines. Popular pre-COVID digital literacy workshops that had offered community members a tailored opportunity for device help and helped many technology newcomers to get connected were switched to a phone help service at the start of the pandemic to assist people to get online. And we have many how-to instructional videos on getting connected to the internet or your device or the library e-resources, and they're offered on the library YouTube channel. And importantly, this support to be digitally connected and literate is continuing. Next slide, please. I'd like to talk a little bit about the Wyndham Tech School. This was established uh, about four years ago and is one of only 10 in the state. This school complements and extends the curriculum and access to technology of Wyndham secondary schools. The Wyndham Tech School supports students to think creatively, work together to solve real world problems posed by local industries and helps prepare them for the future by delivering the advanced education and STEM skills they need to compete in the future job market. The Wyndham Tech School is hosted by Victoria University. So it pro provides access to advanced technology, industry programs and exposure to career pathways that secondary students may not otherwise have access to. Students remain enrolled in their local schools, but attend classes at the tech school campus. Programs are designed in partnership with local industry, teachers and the tech school facilitators and have a focus on in-demand skills and emerging careers, particularly the digital and creative problem solving skills that underpin all careers in Industry 4.0. Next slide, thanks. I'd like to talk about the Learning for Earning Festival. So the inaugural Learn West Learning for Earning Festival was held in May this year and was organised by the Learn West Network, which comprises representatives from Wyndham Council and five other neighbouring local government areas in the west and inner north suburbs of Melbourne. The members of the Learn West Network are united in the belief that lifelong learning drives growth in communities, economic, civic and social capacity in the Western Metro region. The festival was developed in response to the similar challenges faced by our respective communities in the face of the pandemic. By pooling our resources and networks and contacts, the network was able to maximise outcomes for their respective communities. So this year's Learning for Earning Festival featured 30 free, practical and inspirational virtual workshops over the th three days to help upskill and motivate community members and aim to help people gain knowledge in starting or changing careers, learn about dominant and emerging local industries and discover opportunities for the future. 
and being online, the festival ensured access to a greater number of community members. Uh, next slide, thanks. So the Wyndham Learning Festival. This is a result of a partnership between Wyndham Community and Education Centre and the Wyndham Council. And it ran for its sixth year uh, in 2021. The festival is held in early September every year and it coincides with Australia's Adult Learners Week and provides the opportunity to showcase and celebrate free lifelong learning opportunities across Wyndham. Initially this year, we had planned a hybrid festival, but lockdowns forced us to go completely online at the very last minute. This presented challenges for some event providers to pivot their event to online. As organisers, we were able to provide support to those that needed it to make the switch. Feedback that we've got as part of the festival evaluation indicates that many learners were appreciative of the fact that they could access events online, particularly during lockdown. Future lockdowns notwithstanding, it would seem that our communities have an expectation and for some a preference for the opportunity of learning in a virtual context. Next slide, thanks. <clears throat> so it brings me to the Global Learning Festival. So this ran from the 8th to the 11th of November uh, this year. And the Global Learning Festival showcased over 95 live and recorded events delivered from across the globe, from Australia, the US, the UK, Israel, Northern Ireland, Taiwan, Canada, Bangladesh, Kenya, Benin, Colombia, Finland, Italy, Lithuania, and Turkey. So the Global Learning Festival is co-hosted by Wyndham and our neighbor Melton, along with other over 20 learning communities around the world. And it ran for the second time this year. The idea for the first Global Learning Festival in 2020 arose during the early stages of the pandemic with learning communities around the world cancelling or postponing their local learning festivals. So the Global Learning Festival aims to bring unity and connection to communities all over the world and to give learners a first-hand experience of the benefits that lifelong learning can bring, particularly during uncertain and challenging times. 2021 saw strong support, partnership and collaboration from Pascal International Observatory, the Australian Learning Communities Network, Adult Learning Australia, the UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities, RMIT University <clears throat> and the WISE Qatar Foundation. And, <clears throat> excuse me, Topics were very broad. They went from anything around cooking, history, environment and sustainability, international development, inclusion, entrepreneurship, reconciliation, gardening, um, hope and attachment, mentoring, mental health, STEM, all the talks. There was truly something for everyone. And some recorded events can still be viewed on the Global Learning Festival website. Next slide, thanks. That brings me to the end. I wish I had more time to share some of the initiatives Wyndham um, is spearheading in this space, but I think my time is up. Um, you can have a look at our Wyndham Learning City page on our council website for more information on our projects. If you'd like to know more um, or are interested in collaborating with Wyndham in the future, I'd be more than happy to link up with any of you. And thanks once again for this opportunity to share some of Wyndham with you all. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. It's uh, really impressive to see how you addressed, how the city addressed the challenges uh, during the last uh, past two years. It's also very impressive to see that you're, how you're managing with uh, the celebrations, celebrations of lifelong learning and how you actually keep the, the motivation for your citizens to, to learn continuously. That's really very nice to see. Thank you. We have now, yes, the time is running. So we have our last presentation from Professor Michael Osborne and uh, from the University of Glasgow. And yes, I think he, you can see already the, the title. It's about the smart and the learning city. So please go ahead, Michael. Thank you. 
Um, thank you, Christina, and um, thanks once again to UIL and the Asia Development Bank for inviting me to speak today. Um, commonly, I seem to have the last spot in webinars, I remember, and in seminars, I remember the same uh, happening a few weeks ago in Yehensu. So the challenge is for me to say something different from anything anyone else has said. Um, I'll try my best. The, um, I, um, I'm at the University of Glasgow. I'm a director of the Pascal Observatory, which Diane alluded to earlier. And we've been working in this area of, of learning cities for um, some while, have our own network of learning cities, and we work very collaboratively with UIL. Um, I'm also um, a co-investigator within the Urban Big Data Center, and I'll say a little bit more about uh, that center later on. And for an Asia link, I'm um, uh, the uh, one of the um, uh, co-chair of the International um, Advisory Group to the Asia Pacific Learning Cities Alliance, which has been set up recently in Korea. So when I, when I think um, about smart cities, um, I sometimes think about my uh, gas meter. Um, I used to have an old digital meter and um, I now have a, a smart meter which, which does everything for me, but um, unfortunately it doesn't work all the time. Um, and so it is, I'm afraid, with some aspects of smartness and that's going to be my focus in this, this very brief discussion. Um, so I think the the we, we know, I guess, um, what what smart cities are about. Uh, they're about the use of of smart technologies, uh, focusing on on technical solutions that relate to to a whole range of of aspects of of living in in cities, um, economic development, mobility, um, environmental solutions. Uh, providing a range of, of, of services to people, governance arrangements and improving living, living conditions. And, and very often um, these come from the technologists. They're determined by the available technology. They take advantage of um, the Internet of Things, the fact that so many devices now are, are linked to each other. We see various numbers bandied around and uh, when, I, when I last looked, um, there are something like 32 billion devices in the world that are linked to each other. And of course, it's linked to uh, the increasing power of, of computers um, and, and artificial intelligence. Um, there are, of course, links to, to big data. And again, it's the fact that computing power has increased so much um, that, that we are able to do many clever things in, in linking data sets that would have been unimaginable um, even, even uh, 10 years ago. Um, so for, for instance, some of the work that we do is about linking, linking data sets from, from administrative data sets from one sector of education, let's say from schools through to vocational education to look at transitions from uh, one, one sector to another. And I, I remember 20 years ago doing this work um, and with a colleague, and I think it took seven or eight days of a computer uh, um, trying to link you know, every individual in one data set to every individual in another data set around three key markers um, in order to understand um, transitions. We were trying to identify who in one data set was in the other data set, essentially, in the absence of any other marker. Now we would probably be able to do that in minutes, if not seconds. So there are many, many examples around the world of, of, of um, countries which have adopted uh, smart solutions, and I've just chosen one here as an example that, that illustrates uh, some, some of the things that are going on around the world. And I think we all know that Singapore um, is uh, an extremely good example of uh, an, a national transformation uh, using smart technologies, which cover 
all as aspects of, of, of services and support for, for citizens. And, and very much something that, that comes from the top um, with a certain amount of input from citizens themselves. Um, in this era of, 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 of data, however, um, often um, the, the, we, we collect data about all, all sorts of things which uh, we're interested in, but we're not quite sure what the questions are. And this is one of the criticisms of, of, of some of the work that goes on in this field. I'll come back to that later. Um, I think one of the key issues, and this has been alluded to previously by some of the speakers, is about how citizens themselves engage in all this smartness uh, around them. Um, so the accessibility and openness of data nowadays does prepare society uh, uh, for, for changes which have been triggered by innovative and, and smart technologies. It gives all sorts of opportunities. Um, peer-to-peer -peer platforms, information sharing. Um, and of course, digital services do improve the quality of life for citizens. So just one example of that uh, I've just chosen here is the Urban Flow Project in, in Helsinki, where there's an actual real-time data flow and feedback between citizens and administrators in the city so that citizens can be real co-constructors of knowledge in the spirit of citizen science in, in that sort of model. Another good example of uh, engagement um, with citizens is, is in the Amsterdam smart city model with, with a whole range of different initiatives, some of which I, I've listed there. Some of our speakers earlier um, spoke about climate change. Um, another example, uh, the Fujisawa Sustainable Smart Town has a focus on the role of, of digital technologies uh, and, 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 and smartness in, in relation to challenges which, which are environmental. So here we see a lot of echoes of the learning city that David was talking about earlier, because if we can use technology in the right way, we are doing some of the things that the learning city is trying to do. And to summarize, the learning city is about mobilizing resources across every sector to promote uh, inclusive learning, revitalizing learning in families and communities and facilitating learning for and, and in the workplace, a, a definition that comes from UIL. It also, and this echoes um, uh, Dr. Ra's um, presentation at the very beginning of, of the session today, it, it, it echoes the, 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 the thoughts that he had about learning cities and uh, the learning society mobilizing every sector. And it would include museums and galleries, environmental services, social services, and, and so on. And of course, the technology that we have nowadays does make that potentially much easier than it ever would have been previously. But of course, there's, there's always a but. Um, and we've done a number of studies around the world, um, including in the UK, in India, in Kyrgyzstan, around um, smart city developments. And one of the things that emerges uh, in, in some of the things that we, we've looked at are the dangers of new digital divides, especially we used to talk about um, digital divides as, as being class-based. Uh, the new types of digital divides which are emerging uh, are by age and, and by migrant and, and refugee status. And, and clearly not everybody has access to the sorts of technology that exists to take advantage of the smart solutions that are offered by cities. And I think it leads us to, to uh, an observation that in many smart city developments, we don't actually see these developments being accompanied by a focus on learning. 
and especially non-formal adult learning. And there are certainly, as it appears to me in many of the, of the developments, the lack of a high level strategy linking the smart with learning. And that's dumb for sure. Uh, and I, I would suggest to all of you to just look if you live in a smart city at some of the policies and see how much of a focus there is in your smart city policy on learning. There are other types of dangers. And one of the countries, as I said, that we've looked at has been India and some commentators around some of the smart city development. And there's a project in India to develop 100 smart cities have been quite critical of, of some of these initiatives because of the types of social apartheid that seem to have developed. Um, so essentially some of the developments of smart cities are developing extremely well-serviced cities, um, but around them, very poorly serviced and in impoverished towns and, and villages. And some of the cities have very strong uh, governance structures, uh, quite strong uh, policing, uh, places where uh, some citizens are allowed the freedom to, to move, but others aren't. And, um, a focus on the privately organized uh, structures of learning cities being uh, an improvement over, over publicly organized ones. I said I was speaking today from the, the urban big data center with my urban big data center hat on, and that's a, a, research, a research resource promoting the use of innovative methods and and complex urban data to address uh, global city challenges. And the sorts of things that we're doing are developing novel solutions for using and sharing urban big data, as well as providing uh, access uh, to that data uh, to, to, to anyone who wishes to use it and providing training and various types of outreach activities and, and delivering what we hope is, is cutting edge research. And I do think there are lots of possibilities for us uh, in the future in relation to um, research that links um, technology and learning. Obviously, we all know about uh, learning analytics, the way in which we can actually study uh, behaviors of students in learning environments and, and provide uh, paths for them uh, through uh, learning structures uh, based on those sorts of behaviors. Equally well, we can use some of these uh, urban uh, big data techniques to actually look at relationships between learning and a whole set of different variables that we've never uh, been able to do before and look, at, look, for example, at relationships between uh, learning and use of transport. Um, learning and housing conditions, um, the relationship between um, access to green space and uh, the success of individuals in their learning. There's a whole range of different things that we, we can potentially do in the future. My final observation probably is that um, we, we do have all of these technologies available to us now that we, we couldn't have imagined in the past. And, but perhaps the technology is now much advanced of our pedagogy. And I made this reflection when I spoke in Korea recently um, in relation to responses to COVID-19. There are a huge number of online uh, programs now available, but I don't think uh, we in the field of education yet have caught up with the technology uh, that is available and adapted our pedagogies appropriately. And finally, uh, if you're interested in some of the work uh, that we've done around smart cities and lifelong learning, 
here are some references uh, that, that you can look at. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael, for all these observations and uh, thoughtful remarks, and also giving the, the practical examples from the, from the cities. Um, yes, so now we have a little time, a little less than we expected for some questions and answers. And uh, yes, Dr. Valenzuela wanted to moderate the question and answer section. I don't see right now in the chat, uh, but I'm sure there are attendees here in the in the webinar that have questions to the speakers. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Christina, and thank you to all our speakers today. This is a very rare and important opportunity to really share your ideas, your experiences, and your practice with uh, all of your expertise. And I don't see any question coming from the Q&A box, but I think uh, based on uh, all your sharing and, and knowing that cities are the powerhouse of the future, that we really need to you know, increase the rapid pace of change, but be cautioned about the pandemic that we're having. There is also a, a, a lot of emphasis on the fragility of our global ecosystem and our uh, concern on climate change. What do you think is, is a way forward as expert on LLL, lifelong learning and uh, learning cities? Could you give some key recommendations for those who would like to follow the practices shared by Diane? Yes. What would be the way forward for others? Like, you know, city administrators, some managers who are thinking about, you know, having this, they cannot copy paste all the examples that you have shared certainly, but if, if you would like to share key points on uh, moving forward with developing this uh, city, which is resilient, green cities, healthy cities, cities of opportunities, cities that are connected and we reduce our poverty. What could be the, the way forward? Uh, I, I Diane, some, you? Yes, Diane, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Um, I think some key things that, uh, some, some common threads, I think throughout the examples I gave were that we were listening to our communities um, so we were hearing what their needs are, what they um, what what they were interested in, but what they were wanting, and um, what what issues they were having, and how we could use learning uh, as a way of addressing some of those issues and challenges. Um, so listening is a really key thing, um, and I, I think it, it's probably stating the obvious to 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 have to remain agile and flexible with what you are delivering uh, and how you are delivering it. Um, and underpinning everything we do, uh, partnerships and collaborations. So uh, something that we realized um, very early on, um, you know, as COVID was taking hold at the, at the beginning of last year was that importance of communication between our partnerships and keeping in touch with um, how your partners are faring when you're working collaboratively with them, because if one sinks, we all sink. So maintaining those relationships in the good times or the bad times um, uh, as, a, as a, a basis of um, ongoing work together. I think they're, they're my key takeaways. Thank you very much, Diane, for sharing that, of course, partnership and looking at the context of your city, right? Uh, I remember judging uh, several literacy awards in, in the Philippines, and uh, every time we visit the city, they have all of these uh, names or focus, and they focus on health literacy and, uh, you know, all, all of these titles. But I think, yeah, you need to see the context. Uh, you cannot copy paste the practices in other cities and bring that to you and also develop more partnership uh, 
this is really something very interesting, no? But uh, Michael, uh, Professor Michael, do you have some uh, key suggestions on this? Uh, how how administrators, learning city coordinators, mayors, and others uh, would would really promote connectivity in their lifelong learning agenda as well as promoting smart city projects. Michael? Well, that's 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 a long question. I was um I mean as as Diane says, having a a, a strong governance and administrative infrastructure that brings all partners together is 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 extremely important. Um, in terms of um the smart technologies. I've just seen a couple of questions that have come up there, and um, how to link smart, uh, uh, how to smart link lifelong learning with shifting careers and, and workforces. Um, it's an interesting area because there are now there there are now uh, so called intelligence intelligent learning systems uh, platforms that 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 use um, um, te technological approaches in order to guide people through potential learning solutions that can be linked to their career aspirations and their and their job aspirations um which is interesting but i i'm not sure yet whether whether that's that that's that's proven um but you know the 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 technology is there um whether whether technology is always the solution I, I i i'm not always sure so we have to be we have to be a little bit a bit cautious in, in terms of, of of reliance uh on that so um but back to the um to the the, the main question about learning city structures yeah i mean i think it's 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 about partnership collaboration uh, it, you've said yourself um learning from others but but learning from others in, in, a, in a critical sort of way, because we can't transfer what exists in Wyndham to another city in the world whole. But it's important for different cities to be talking to each other and for cities which are aspiring to be learning cities to join networks. So, you know, not everyone is a fully, not every city is a fully developed learning city. Uh, many are, are aspirational. But if they join networks and have conversations uh, around topic areas that are of particular importance to them, they will get some insights and there will be some things which are potentially transferable. Very well said, Professor Michael. Yes, uh, sharing good practices, doing this in a conversational manner, sharing all your issues challenges and uh you know these are really very very important to local city coordinators mayors and others before i throw the question in the chat box uh dr david uh, do you want to say something or you know contribute to the discussions and conversations david yes uh, uh, thank you in, in relation to to your question uh in linking uh learning cities with uh, the challenges of sustainability. I would just like to, to mention a very uh, recent uh, example um, that comes from uh, the learning city of Yonsu uh, in Korea, where we, we just had the uh, international uh, conference of, of learning cities. During the, the conference, uh, the city actually uh, released uh, a commitment to uh, make Yonsu uh, uh, carbon uh, neutral. Uh, so there is, uh, you know, a, a very, in this case, a very clear uh, plan and, and policy uh, to contribute uh, uh, to, to climate action. Uh, and as a learning city, you know, the approach will also be to see, I mean, what, uh, to what extent uh, lifelong learning can actually uh, contribute to, to the adaptation to the changes which are required, both in terms of uh, the economy, but also, also in terms of the uh, behavior of, of, of citizens as, as consumers to actually meet uh, uh, this carbon neutrality uh, goal. So I think that's a, a very good example 
also on, on how the learning city approach can uh, contribute uh, to a very uh, concrete you know, commitment in relation uh, to climate action. Now, in relation to smart cities, I would just like to um, you know, mention two important outcomes of the general conference of UNESCO that just completed its work. Member states uh, adopted two important new uh, normative instruments, one a recommendation on open science, and I think that uh, we just heard from the presentation from Windham and also uh, Michael that the importance of the open source movement also for learning cities to make really uh, information knowledge available uh, to all and, and to make education, but to some extent also technology, a common good. And I think this, uh, in a way, addresses some of the issues that have been expressed in uh, connection with uh, smart cities. The second instrument uh, is the recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence. Again, uh, we see that artificial intelligence is now penetrating all areas uh, of, of our life. Uh, but it also constitutes a very powerful tool uh, for uh, education and developing new new tools for, for, for learning. At the same time, you know, uh, there are uh, issues uh, uh, related to the use of this technology, uh, who controls it, who has access to, 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 to data of learners, and this uh, recommendation provides uh, uh, important uh, guidelines, you know, how to, to, to make uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, more ethical. And this has also, I think, a, a lot of, of value for its implementation in, in smart cities. So I just wanted to uh, you know, give you an update of those important developments, which also have, I think, you know, an effect at local level for learning cities and smart cities. Well said, Director David. We really can learn a lot, especially if you will visit the website of UIL. Uh, there are so many documentation, policy recommendations, and good practices from different cities all over the world. And the last one was in Korea, right? So there is one question here from Katarina. Smart cities are an ambitious concept requiring high level of knowledge and skills. What will happen to marginalized groups? Is digital divide getting bigger? So I don't know who would like to answer this from our panel, but uh, you are open to provide a reply, especially reaching the marginalized groups and the digital divide. Who would like to provide some comments on that? Well, I, I can say something if you if if you want, because I, I did talk about it and I can only agree with Katerina, but it, it's just emphasizing again that uh, the the importance and I'm sure David will agree with this, the, the importance on focusing on um, literacy, which is one of the, you know, one of the main um, ambitions of, of UIL and we, we just simply have to put more efforts in increasing digital literacy and making technology uh, available in a more ubiquitous way because people simply are not gonna be able to access many of these smart services unless they have the digital literacy, the information literacy to be able to do so and the devices and the access to broadband facilities uh, to be able to do this. Um, so there are, you know, there, 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 there are fantastic solutions available, but there are also challenges if, if people don't have these things in order to take advantage of the solutions which exist. Thank you, Professor Michael. I think there are also some questions in the chat box that uh, directly, uh, you know, um, can be answered by you. Now, let me go to one question here. Uh, how do you see the learning city coordinators with the knowledge of lifelong learning connect more closely with those who run smart city projects within a city? Uh, Ms. Dayang, would you like to answer this question or contribute to the discussion? This more of capacity building and uh, prioritizing. Dayang, please. Yeah, yes. Um... I guess answering from within my own council, we, we do try to 
collaborate and, and have a relationship with our smart city unit. Um, so I think uh, that that idea of you know building collaborations and partnerships and relationships um, so that um, I think that I think it was um, Mike's point about um, that, that question to all of us, you know, check your smart city policy to see if learning is in there. Um, so making sure that lifelong learning is on the table, uh, regardless of who you're collaborating with. And, you know, I think trying to sort of spread the word or spread the passion for lifelong learning throughout, um, in my case, the, the council, um, you know, or, or throughout your organisation. I, I, I think um, sometimes when we come to these webinars, it, it sort of feels like, um, you know, we're with our own people. We all speak the same lifelong learning language. Um, but I, you know, I go back and I talk to some of my colleagues that are sort of further away from my business unit. Um, and you know we could be from two different planets, so it, it, it's it, it's a little bit of spruiking and convincing and um, promoting the, the lifelong learning ideas. Thank you very much, Diane, and also thank you very much, Professor Michael, for answering many of the questions. And uh, Dr. David, uh, well, if you want to know more about UNESCO Global Learning City, just visit the website of uh, UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning, and they can uh, uh, be useful in providing benchmarks and learning from those cities who have made it. And we don't have enough time, but uh, you may uh, perhaps use a uh, chat box if you still have some questions and uh, maybe get in touch with the speakers later. Um, well, um, okay. I would like to, sorry, we really don't have time. And I would like to pass on to Christina, please. Thank you, Christina. Thank you so much, Dr. Ethel. Thank you so much. I think uh, this was very rewarding to have this uh, moment of questions and answers. And uh, of course, we are always, uh, we welcome more questions. So please write to the learning cities at unesco.org email if you have more questions coming up after this webinar. Um, thank you so much for having this opportunity today with the Asian Development Bank, uh, having this webinar together. And I'm speaking uh, also on behalf of the whole GNLC team and the um, team leader, Mr. Raul Valdez Cotera, who is absent today. And I think from all the different perspectives and angles that we heard, we had the book presentation, we heard from the authors directly, we had the historic outline, but also really perspectives for the future on technology and digitalization. And we very often hear from our learning city as well, how important collaboration and yes, solidarity is. And we, we have seen this um, during the whole time that really the learning cities, they are really able to, to connect. They want to connect. They are very, um, yes, um, collaborative. And, and, and this is something that they even want to, to strengthen more. So, I, I think we also hear that a smart and livable learning city of tomorrow, it, it can be designed in a very successful, successful cooperation between citizens, the administration and, and politics and based on the existing challenges, of course, and technology trends. And these trends are increasingly, I mean, determining how we live, work and educate ourselves, how we spend our free time and how we communicate with each other and how we share knowledge and help each other. And that's exactly where the local level is coming in and, and the power of this local level, because that's where it's happening continuously and a, at a very large scale. And um, we think as, as part of the Learning Cities team that a city that re really uses these influences positively for public services and administration that it will find new opportunities and it will mobilize potential for its citizens and, and also for the business. Um, and with the help of digitalization, it can be smart and 
thus more attractive for uh, different age groups, young and the elderly people, but also for, for family and companies and, and talents in, in general. And we really hope that learning cities uh, are livable cities and where learning can flourish across the world. And this is really something that we also observe that uh, within a country, learning cities are more cooperating together. They are connecting the communities uh, and supporting them. So I, I think as a final remark before I give the, the floor to, uh, to Dr. Pant, this is really very, the, the benefit of a learning city because it's really also, it, it makes learning grow and which is future focused, locally connected, but also globally relevant. So thank you so much for having me also here today. And uh, yes, last but not least, we can hear from the chief of education sector group from the Asian Development Bank. And this is Mr. Pan, so please. Yeah, uh, it, it is a great pleasure to join such an important discussion. Uh, many thanks to UNESCO Lifelong Learning Institute and the Global Learning Cities Network for hosting this webinar. Many thanks to David Acharina and Christina Drews. It is great to meet Ethel again. Uh, we have had several programs where we shared our thoughts in many topics in education. ADB and UNESCO uh, have common goals of ensuring learning for all. Education systems need to constantly reinvent and become more agile to serve the needs of individuals, economies, and societies. For instance, Finland has one of the best education systems in the world, yet they keep on finding ways to innovate and improve. For example, the latest is their phenomenal learning through integrated uh, or interdisciplinary approach. Their STEAM education in the city of Turku is equally exemplary. Similarly, Singapore's skills future is now globally well known on how the government is providing uh, 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 its workforce and institutions to pursue reskilling and upskilling to remain current, relevant, and productive. Many successful countries are also interested to pursue these approaches. The pandemic has upended the conventional thinking about education. Education has remained largely the same since the classroom modality was introduced, where learners are expected to be at the receiving end. However, learners are expected to be co-creators uh, to add uh, and deepen uh, uh, knowledge and skills. Other sectors like health are already transforming significantly. For a sector that is supposed to prepare tomorrow's leaders and workforce, education needs to more to continuously learn and reimagine on how to be more impactful. This is critical to optimize human intelligence and promote innovative thinking to anticipate and solve a range of emerging problems and challenges by preparing self-directed lifelong learners that can uh, navigate an increasingly uh, an increasingly uncertain world impacted by digitalization uh, and technological changes, urbanization, demographic and environmental trends, such as aging, climate change, COVID-19 and shifting labor market as were, as were alluded to earlier. ADB strategy 2030 emphasizes synergy across all ADB sectors as education, health, urban development, transport, climate change, energy, water, agriculture and finance. Human capital is one of the central pillars of development. It is being prioritized by many countries such as Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam in the region to achieve sustainable development and accelerated growth. Uh, ADB is part of UNESCO uh, coalition for post-COVID response and we highly value our engagement with different strands of work of UNESCO. We consulted closely with UNESCO on the preparation of the COVID-19 education sector guidance note and we have good interactions between ADB and UNESCO as part of the Tibet Interagency Working Group. The Global Education Forum has emphasized the need to expand support to the education sector. There are many common interests. And uh, like Sangsub said, we look forward to more exchanges in the future as well. Let me end by sharing a quote from Mahatma Gandhi that underscores the importance of lifelong learning and knowledge. Live as if you will die tomorrow, meaning live humbly, seek knowledge as if you live forever, meaning recharge yourself with new thinking 
and ideas all the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, David. Thank you, Ethel. Mike and Dan, it is very good to hear you. Thank you. And similarly, I've just downloaded your book. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so I'll read that with interest and promote it on our websites. Well, great. Thank you. So look forward to <laughs> talking to you again soon. <laughs> Thank you to all and good goodbye. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. This is very, Thank very you. good event. Also, I learned a lot also at the same time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, David, uh, Michael, uh, Diane, also Christina. Thank Adele, you. thanks for the moderating all those. And there is Christina. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Brother, I like your, uh, your